In the novel, you don't actually say what you think of these people. You simply produce them for us. Is this your particular method of writing? Well, yes, I think it is. I think I'm that sort of writer. Uh, I think that the... Uh, I would agree, in fact, with what Wilde said. Uh, was it in the preface to um, Dorian Gray? that art uh, had nothing to do with moral attitudes. Uh, of course, I would uh, modify that. Obviously, there are moral attitudes in the background, but the principal reason for writing about a person is that, uh, that he or she passionately interests you. Christopher Isherwood died on January the 4th, aged 81. He wrote more than a dozen books, fiction, biography, and memoirs. But for most readers, the idea of Isherwood is inseparable from the idea of Berlin in the 1930s. And Isherwood himself found it hard to make the separation. Throughout his life, he kept probing and repolishing the portrait of himself when young. And somehow he stayed young. In the images we have of him, in portraits and television appearances over the years, he is still plausibly the callow, wide-eyed creator of those famous early books. Mr. Norris changes trains, Goodbye to Berlin, and Sally Bowles. As she dialed the number, I noticed that her fingernails were painted emerald green, a colour unfortunately chosen, for it called attention to her hands, which were much stained by cigarette smoking and as dirty as a little girl's. Now, I don't remember that Sally actually had dirty hands. Uh, they were stained, certainly, by cigarette smoking, like everybody's are. But, you see, I, already one, one comes away, uh, one starts to work on certain details and exaggerate them. Her face was long and thin, powdered dead white. And she had very large brown eyes, which should have been darker, to match her hair and the pencil she used for her eyebrows. I suppose that's roughly speaking true. Isherwood's spicy, sinister version of Berlin was based on his own narrow world of lovable, displaced bohemians. The writer Isherwood is always the spectator, the unprejudiced recorder of whatever happens to have happened. But the symbolic ingredients, though accidental in a way, were perfect. Hedonism sporting in the shadow of political brute force. In Berlin, it wasn't enough merely to want sex. You were expected to specialize, to ask for a teenage virgin, a 70-year-old woman, a girl with a whip and high boots, a transvestite, a policeman, a page boy, or a dog. And in case you couldn't make up your mind what you wanted, there was a museum of sexual science where you could study photographs of hermaphrodites, sadist torture instruments, fantasy drawings by nymphomaniacs, female underwear worn by officers beneath their uniform, and many other marvels. The whole idea that I was writing about Berlin is highly misleading. Um, the other day, a uh, German writer um, who was writing a book about that period, a non-fiction book, um, about a, a certain famous person of that period who lived in Berlin, told me that his publishers complained to him because they said, you haven't really got the Berlin of that time in the book. And he said, well, what in the world do you mean? And they said, well, Isherwood's Berlin. I mean, um, uh, there's no decadence in it. And um, it doesn't have the atmosphere. Which, of course, is uh, the kind of thing that only publishers would have the nerve to say to a distinguished German writer, because, I mean, I might just as well have been uh, somebody from, uh, uh, from South Africa who arrived uh, in London and, uh, and wrote about my experiences, and then that was called London, you know, at that period. It's absurd. The blonde, no matter of what nationality, had been a magical figure for Christopher from his childhood, and would continue to be so for many years. Christopher chose to identify himself with a black-haired British ancestor, and to see the blonde as the invader who comes from another land to conquer and rape him. Thus, the blonde becomes the masculine foreign yang, mating with Christopher's feminine native yin. Uh, in a sense, I, I, I'm sorry that I didn't say flat out that I was a homosexual, but as I was pointing out to, um, uh, when I was right, I read, had an interview the other day with one of the gay magazines here, I was pointing out that the 
Actually, if I had, it would have been such a production, uh, the coming out and the trumpets and the unmasking, that it would have ruined, uh, it would have absolutely upset the apple cart. The, uh, the other characters would have been uh, upstaged. It was very important that this observer should have been rather sexless, uh, at least how, uh, as how it seemed to me at that time, uh, rather un, uh, unobtrusive, just a kind of uh, straight man to take, I mean no pun here, uh, a straight man to take the, uh, to pick up the other people's jokes, you know, and react. I think that his relations with people, with other people, was a kind, not exactly a kind of identification, but a sort of getting right inside them and somehow recreating them as part of himself almost, or as his vision of them. I think it's uh, uh, Kingsley Amis pointed out that, I think in the early criticism, that it was that it was a kind of failure of imagination in a way, that he couldn't invent a, a character, Kings, Kingsley Amis said. And it is true that uh, Christopher once said to me that he couldn't imagine how people behaved when he wasn't in the room. I mean, if you, even his friends, he could only, it was only if he was there, as it were, like a sort of controller in a sort of medium session, that everything worked. And when it did work, it worked as, as magic, because everything became sort of magnified through his sensibility, you see. Berlin was in a state of civil war. Hate exploded suddenly without warning out of nowhere, at street corners, in restaurants, cinemas, dance halls, swimming baths at midnight, after breakfast, in the middle of the afternoon. In the middle of a crowded street, a young man would be attacked, stripped, thrashed, and left bleeding on the pavement. In 15 seconds, it was all over, and the assailants had disappeared. The newspapers were full of deathbed photographs of rival martyrs, Nazi, Reichsbanner, and communist. My pupils looked at them and shook their heads, apologizing to me for the state of Germany. Dear, dear, they said, it's terrible. It can't go on. He wasn't really poli political about, even about the Nazis. I mean, he was anti-Nazi, of course, and he saw that how terribly they behaved in Berlin and so on. All that comes into his books. But there's always the feeling underneath it, I think, which is that he might very well have got to know some terrible Nazi. And then he would have written something about him, showing how terrible he was and so on, but that the real sort of connection was a kind of sympathy, almost love, for the other, other person, however uh, wicked he, uh, he may be, you see. I think it was partly a class thing, but of course it was inextricably mixed up with my homosexuality, because um, uh, what I, in fact, started to uh, uh, encounter was the, uh, the, the German working class. And uh, there was a, a, an escape there from the upper uh, middle class to which I belonged, sort of landed gentry background. And I wanted to, uh, to be with these boys, uh, not really just for sexual reasons, uh, nearly so much as to escape into another sort of world. Isherwood was born in Cheshire, and his family background is usually described as old established. His mother, Kathleen, appears in several of his stories, a genteel, well-meaning innocent. His father, Frank, died in the First World War. The novelist, Edward Upward, knew Christopher at school. Uh, he had to revolt, of course, really. And uh, it, it was a revolt against his, his whole um, social class, upper class background. You know, his father was a regular army officer who was killed in the... First World War, while Christopher was at uh, his prep school, and the headmaster and other teachers were constantly reminding him that he must try and um, live up to his hero father. And this, uh, may, th this, I think, more than anything else, made him a rebel. 